Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our discussion of the year 1968. In our previous lecture, we talked a little bit about some of the background of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and early 1960s. In this lecture, we'll continue with that background of civil rights, which again is one of the most important social factors as we arrive at our year of 1968 itself. I concluded the previous lecture by talking a little bit about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which improved many of the civil rights for African Americans in this country. And so the question became, after the passage of that act, what would African Americans do? Where do we go next and what do we do next? Lyndon Johnson, for his part, hoped that the civil rights movement would back off a little bit and quiet down because they had accomplished a number of their goals already. But in fact, leaders of the civil rights movement pushed ahead with even greater vigor. They wanted to enact and enforce the measures that the Civil Rights Act had put down on paper in Washington. And this leads us to what was known as Freedom Summer in 1964, just after the Civil Rights Act passed. Civil rights leaders determined to go to one of the strongholds of racism in this country, Mississippi, and try to enforce the measures that the Civil Rights Act had put in place. Early in 1964, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, led by Robert Moses, or Bob Moses, decided to bring the movement to Mississippi. How bad was Mississippi? Well, we need to recall that in 1955, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old black boy, was lynched and tortured to death in Mississippi just for saying goodbye to a white woman in a store. In 1961, a black man who tried to register to vote was murdered in broad daylight in Mississippi by a man named E.H. Hurst. Hurst was never tried, but several days later another black man who had witnessed the crime was murdered as well. No one served any time for these crimes. In short, Mississippi was as bad as it had been at any time in its history. So in 1964, when SNCC decided to bring their efforts into rural Mississippi, they understood that this was a very dangerous undertaking. But many of the volunteers, both white and black, young, college age, who came from the north in many cases, had no idea what they were getting into. But they learned very quickly on June 21st, a car containing three of the volunteers, Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney, disappeared. Eventually, their bodies were found, and the story began to leak out that they had been captured and tortured and killed by local whites. This was the introduction of many of those volunteers to Freedom Summer, and the process only eroded from there. Since it was judged unnecessarily risky by Lyndon Johnson, he didn't offer any federal support or protection for the protesters. Many of the volunteers were white northerners, as I mentioned, who came to this rural south with little understanding of what life was like and the culture. And while they meant well, they often came across as glib or cocky to blacks who had been living in that area for their entire lives. The presence of white female volunteers was particularly troublesome and eventually was part of what crippled the movement. Without even knowing it, they were in a catch-22. There were inevitably some advances from black men. If they rejected them, they were branded as racist. If they accepted them, they were subjected to hatred and animosity from black women in the movement. And there were a number of these kind of internal fault lines within the Freedom Summer movement, and eventually it crumbled without achieving much success. By late 1964, the movement changed its focus to voting rights, and specifically Selma, Alabama. This was a small town with a majority of black citizens, but only a very small black voting population. By October, Martin Luther King was in Selma to launch what he called Project Alabama. Project Alabama. 
King didn't know it, but his briefcase, containing detailed plans of the project, fell into enemy hands. Law enforcement agents all over the state, and for that matter all across the South, knew that King intended to provoke violence from the police in order to draw attention, which had worked in several other cases before. The sheriff in that county was James G. Clark, Jim Clark. The plan was to march, to inspire violence, to get press coverage, and to force change. King led the black marches to register to vote, first a few, then in growing numbers. By January of 1965, Clark had become more high-handed and brutal. Hundreds and even thousands were arrested, but there was not as yet the outright vicious violence that had drawn so much attention before. In protest against a murder of a black man in a neighboring county, blacks planned a march from Selma to Montgomery. Governor George Wallace would not tolerate such a march. While the television cameras rolled, Sheriff Clark and his men viciously attacked the marchers with bullwhips and rubber tubing wrapped with barbed wire, with chains, with cattle prods, and tear, ga tear gas. More than 50 were hospitalized. Networks interrupted their regular programming to show the attacks. Martin Luther King decided to resume the march in the aftermath of the violence. Johnson tried to discourage it, but ultimately didn't want to increase the attention drawn on Martin Luther King. Then three white ministers were attacked and one died. There was national outrage. Lyndon Johnson addressed the nation, saying that he was going to force a law to strengthen voting rights. And also behind the scenes, he authorized the march to Montgomery, which Martin Luther King eventually led. On August 3, 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act, which authorized federal authorities to register voters and outlawed discriminatory, discriminatory measures at the polls, like literacy tests, and others. In essence now, de jure discrimination had been defeated, discrimination under the law. And yet, de facto discrimination continued to exist, discrimination as a matter of fact. Johnson also issued Executive Order 11246 in September of 1965, which said that employers holding government contracts should take affirmative action to ensure equal opportunity. This was eventually extended to women as well in 1967. It was a very controversial measure though, and many wondered if ultimately it was reverse discrimination. And there would be many court cases over the decades to come debating whether affirmative action was a good thing or not. The push for black equality went hand in hand with Johnson's broader call for social reform which I discussed in the previous lectures, called The Great Society. This called for an attack on all fronts, improving medical and health care, social security, and one of Johnson's pet programs, the so-called War on Poverty. The War on Poverty did mark some successes. It was a broad and ambitious campaign for reform, reflecting Johnson's genuine concern for the masses. It improved education for many impoverished children, introduced food stamps, and Medicare and Medicaid, which again I talked about previously. But ultimately the war on poverty was undone, largely by the escalating war in Vietnam, and Lyndon Johnson was able to dedicate less and less time and money to these social programs on the home front. We will talk much more about Vietnam in the lectures to come. In the aftermath of the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, questions tore through the Civil Rights Movement and its leaders. What comes next? How do we change de facto discrimination? We've already changed the laws, but how do we change racism itself? Only a week after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, a ghetto in Los Angeles called Watts erupted into violence. What started as a small confrontation between white police and black youth ended in six days of rioting, with 34 dead, nearly 1,000 hospitalized, 4,000 arrested, and $30 million in property damage. Over the following weeks, 
Race riots ripped through Chicago and then Boston, Massachusetts. Such riots were just a prelude for what would be four years of long, hot summers in which race riots tore through much of America, including and especially 1968, which we'll be focusing on. There were extensive riots in 1966 in Chicago, Cleveland, Milwaukee, San Francisco, and many other cities. Part of the problem was that much of the attention of the movement to that point had been focused on the South, mostly in rural settings. But in northern cities and in California, millions of blacks struggled against other forms of injustice. Menial jobs, low pay, poor housing, and police brutality all angered and frustrated urban blacks, who saw little in the civil rights movement that appealed to them. These blacks, many of them young and active, were drawn to the more militant preachings of Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a follower of Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam. This group believed in separatism, the separation of all things black and white. Malcolm X was born Malcolm Little. He was originally from Omaha, Nebraska, but grew up in Lansing, Michigan. One of his earliest memories was of a group of whites throwing his father under the wheels of a streetcar from which he died after several hours of agony. His mother retreated into depression, and Malcolm came to believe early on that white society was the root of all evil. After a youth spent in thievery and petty crime, Malcolm refined his views after spending several years in prison. It was there that he was introduced to the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, and there that he evolved into the militant black leader that began to take much of the spotlight from Reverend King in the mid-1960s. He was a feared and brilliant speaker, the best debater of all the black leaders, including King. He mesmerized audiences and appealed to the masses of dissatisfied blacks with a message of self-reliance, independence, and black pride. Even as he began galvanizing urban northern blacks around him, Malcolm X was assassinated in February of 1965 while giving a speech in Harlem. He died before his own movement could truly solidify, but he voiced frustrations with nonviolence and with King that would come to fruition after his death and that King himself wrestled with for the remaining few years of his own life. By 1965, King began to focus his efforts more on the plight of urban blacks. He spent that summer, 1965, living in Chicago organized principally against housing problems and mass segregation. He organized marches and rallies, but found that the masses of whites who turned out in opposition to his action were far larger than those in the South. He was also frustrated by the politics of Mayor Richard Daley, who ran the city under his tight control. After an entire summer of activism, King finally settled on a ten-point pact with Daley that addressed only a few superficial needs of the impoverished. The summer was dubbed Operation Drop in the Bucket by the many who were not satisfied with this outcome. The Civil Rights Movement was moving in new directions. In June of 1966, James Meredith, who had been the first black student at the University of Mississippi in 1962, set out on a protest march. Not long into the march, he was shot in the back by a white man who jumped out of the woods. Blacks erupted in protest. All of the major civil rights leaders of the time arrived in Mississippi to lead protest marches. King found himself literally drowned out by those calling for an end to nonviolence. Militants in the crowd shouted, White blood will flow and seize power during his address. The leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was Stokely Carmichael. He was the leading voice among militants at the time. At one point in the protest, Carmichael was arrested for sleeping on public grounds. As soon as he was released from jail, Carmichael returned to the protest and made a stirring speech. This is the 27th time I have been arrested, and I ain't going to jail no more. <laughs> 
The only way we're going to stop them white men from whipping us is to take over. We've been saying freedom for six years and we ain't got nothing. What we're going to start saying now is black power. The crowd was mesmerized and he led them in chanting, black power, black power. The chant and the ideas behind it gave new momentum to the civil rights movement and appealed to an audience of blacks who felt the movement had ignored them to that point. African Americans began to take pride in themselves and in their history. African history became a popular subject on college campuses. Militants took to wearing traditional African garb. Others grew even more militant, wearing all black, black leather jackets, black berets, and sunglasses. The most extreme were the Black Panthers, founded in Oakland in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. Formed to combat police brutality, the Black Panthers advocated armed revolt and carried firearms everywhere. In February 1968, SNCC merged with the Black Panthers with Stokely Carmichael as the, quote, prime minister of the group. Meantime, King found his influence was declining. It began in 1965, as he began to alienate Lyndon Johnson. Johnson was jealous of King's success and accolades and began to stop supporting him. Even further, King spoke out against the war in Vietnam in 1965. And by 1967, King had made the anti-war effort his chief cause. He made several arguments in that regard chief among them that the war in Vietnam had bankrupted the war on poverty. Lyndon Johnson admitted that he couldn't afford to fund domestic programs because the Vietnam War had drained his resources. As King said repeatedly, the government spent 500000 to kill every VC in Vietnam, we'll talk more about that later, but only $35 a year on each American in poverty. Other civil rights leaders took up the anti-war cause. Boxer Muhammad Ali was stripped of his title when he refused to submit to the draft. He refused to serve in what he called a white man's war. By the end of 1967, Martin Luther King was planning what would prove to be his, the final campaign of his career, a poor people's campaign. His plan was to assemble an army of impoverished, both white and black, and set up a makeshift camp outside of Washington, D.C., to pressure the president to act. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. This leads us to the events of 1968 itself. We'll talk much, much more about Martin Luther King, about the war in Vietnam, and these other events, starting with our next lecture, when we'll talk about one of the key events in January of 1968, the Tet Offensive in the Vietnam War. Thank you.